Here it is. Now, that's the blue robe. You see the robe? What else do you see on the robe? At the hem of the robe, there are the, the bells and fruit, eh? the pomegranate. Scarlet, blue. It was either scarlet, blue, or the other color was not gold. It was either scarlet, blue, or purple. Yeah, that's what made the, pome the pomegranate, which was a fruit. And then each bell for a fruit. Each fruit, each bell for a fruit. Bell and fruit. Bell and fruit. And we'll look at the bell and fruit. But for now, look at that robe. That is the robe of the ephod. It was blue. And it was made with an opening here so that the priest would put it on. And they made sure that it had a nice hem, a nice binding, so that it does not tear. And that is the robe. And you can read it. It was holy blue. It was a sign that human emotions, that's why it should not tear. That's why it should not burst was not dominant in the life of a priest. In other words, the priest should not live from the soulish realm, but from the spirit realm. You see, the, I taught you the other day, the soul is a seat of emotions, will, and intellect. But God wants you to serve him from a place of the spirit, by faith. He said that's why it's called the spirit of faith. Don't just break down because you have no food. That robe should not tear. Don't just break down because people didn't come for the service or for Deborah. No. Your life is not, should not be dominated by human emotions. That's how to position yourself. Or discouraged. Yeah, yeah. If you are so discouraged, if you are ever from, uh, in a position of discouragement, God will not use discouraged people. That is why God will find Elijah and tell him, wake up. Why are you discouraged? There are 7,000. Because Elijah say, woe ye, woe ye, it's only me. They hate me. They want to kill me. God will not come and sympathize you. That's walking in. That's your life dominated by human emotions. You need to just wake up. Your life should not be dominated by what you feel. Do it by faith. They just shall live by faith. They just shall walk by faith. Otherwise, you can't serve God. You feel discouraged. I will not lead singing today. Why? Because I am discouraged. Now, that is your life dominated by that. I will not go to church today. Why? Because I'm discouraged. That is your life dominated by human emotions. And the life of a priest was not to be dictated. I will not go to that fellowship. Why? They looked at me badly. What is looking at you badly? I will not go to that. Whatever. It's human emotions. The life of a priest, that's why the garment had to be tight so that it does not tear because the life of a priest was not to be dominated by human emotions. You want to be in ministry? You can't, your life cannot be dominated by emotions. You got to silence them. Even when you're feeling so discouraged, even when you, everything, nothing is working, you sing like everything is in place. Even when you have pay, not paid rent for your house or for us, for a sanctuary like this one, we must preach, and we won't preach Malachi chapter 3. We'll still preach the effort. And the ephod will bring the money. You see, that's how God works. Because if your life is dictated, if my life starts to be dictated by the human emotions, I'll look at the offering and I'll say, come on now. You thieves, you steal from God. Malachi 3. No. Listen to God. Sometimes God may want you to just encourage them. When they are encouraged, they'll bring an offering to the Lord. Even your life. Whatever God has called you to do, you cannot allow human emotion. And us ladies, as I said, are more you emotionally oriented. But you care, you go, you got to become a man. Strengthen your inner man. There is no Bible that says strengthen your inner woman. The Bible says strengthen your inner man. In you, that's why you are a woo. Who are you? Woo. So there is a man in? In fact, you are stronger than a man because you have a woo 
in the man. <laughs> you have a womb in the man. So strengthen your inner man who is created in Christ Jesus. Otherwise, if you walk by human emotion, let me tell you, for, that, for us who minister, if we really walked by what people are feeling, you will do nothing. You will close the meeting. Because you receive so many regrets. Sorry, I'm not coming. Sorry, I'm not coming. Sorry, I'm not coming. Hey, me, I said I will preach to three. Now that's strengthening my inner man. Otherwise, if you wait, in fact, you wait for people, they better catch up with you as you're going. Otherwise, don't say you will not do anything because people never came. You come, come early. By 7.30, you're there. No, wait, don't come to say, check for me whether the people have come. <laughs> then they come and peep. Then they say, check for me whether. <laughs> strengthen your inner man. For those of you that are doing ladies' ministry, strengthen your inner man. Be firm. Let's look at the bell and the fruit. He says, and upon its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet. And all around its hem. And bells of gold between them, all around. A golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell and a pomegranate. Upon the hem of the rope, all around. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers. And its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord. And when he comes out, that he may not die. What did that mean? So these are the bells and the pomegranate. You see? The bell, pomegranate. The bell, so it was the bell, pomegranate, bell, for, bell and fruit. Bell and fruit in three threes, eh? Bell and fruit in three threes. Actually, the one that is, you see the one that is on the, on your left is more, much more illustrative than the other one. Because you see, you see the bell and the fruit, the bell and the fruit and the bell and the fruit. That so that they can, the bells can make a sound. These bells and fruit will make a sound when he comes to minister so that he may be heard when he goes in and out of the holy place. What did that mean? Bells, bells are a picture of listening to God while you are in service. So even as you serve him, you learn to listen. You know, you can be really be serving until you're not listening to God. So this reminds you, you position yourself in a way that you are able to listen to him in terms of your prayer life, in terms of reading or hearing the word. So bells are a picture of listening to God while in his service. Two, they are, bells are a picture of listening to God while in his, his service. That's why they sound, they make noise. Pomegranates are a picture of fruitfulness. You must position, you must bear fruit. You shouldn't be the one that starts something, it dies. You start something, it dies. You sing today, tomorrow you're not singing. You preach today, tomorrow you're not preaching. You know, you must bear fruit. Jesus said, if you abide in me and I'll, my words abide in you, then you will bear much fruit. It's about fruitfulness. So bears are a picture of listening to God, making sure that God has your attention. Two, pomegranates are a picture of fruitfulness, making sure that whatever you are doing is bearing fruit, is progressive. Three, the sound of the bell and fruit were an assurance that the high priest is serving before the Lord and that he is alive and well. He's alive and well. Alive and well. And also, they showed a balance between gift and fruit, which is character. Now look at them. It was a pomegranate and a bell. A blue, purple, and a scarlet, like that, like that. Now, when you look at the gifts of the Spirit, they are in three threes, isn't it? First Corinthians chapter 12. In fact, we dwelt on that a lot in our last session. The gifts of the Spirit. Word of wisdom, one of knowledge, faith by the same Spirit. Working of miracles, various kinds of healings, prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, discernment of spirit. There are nine gifts. And then there are, there are nine fruit. We don't call them fruit, but fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. They are also nine. So it was a bell and a fruit, a bell and a fruit. In other words, your life, your character, your ministry, your gifting is accompanied by, by character. That's why it has to be a bell and a fruit. So, you, you know, there are some people who, you know, gifts expose you. You know, they make you known and people praise you. But then your gifts must be accompanied by a good character. 
By your fruit you shall know them. Just says, do not be, do not just believe. I'm paraphrasing. Those who do miracles and do what? It's not how you know them. You know them by their fruits. So it's character, character and gifting. Character and gifting. I don't worry so much about who heals the sick, but I worry about who walks in character, who walks in integrity concerning money issues, who walks in integrity concerning purity, how their sexual life is, who walks in purity in matters relating to their marriage, who walks in that's now character, gift character, gift character, gift character, healing the sick, but fruit of love, fruit of peace, joy is a fruit of the spirit, gentleness, kindness. Self-control is a fruit. So we are balancing the fruit. So it's a bell and fruit, bell and fruit, bell and fruit. Gifting, gifting and character, gifts and character, gifts and character. Position yourself that way. So don't just desire spiritual gifts, the Bible says. Also bear fruit. Let your life be fruitful. And God will make sure that he prunes you so that you can bear fruit. The Bible says, and the branch that bears more fruit he prunes it. No, the branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that he can bear more fruit. You cannot bear more fruit without being pruned by God. That is why God will bring people in your life that prick you with a knife, that stab you at the heart. It has nothing to do with them. It has something to do with you. God wants you to mature in love. And that's a fruit of the spirit. Otherwise the Bible says even if we had all gifting, even if we had all knowledge, but have no love, we are like a, a sounding. So it's, it's just the bell. Do you see it? What does the Bible say? Even if we had no all mystery, even if we, we prophesy, even if we heal the sick, but have no love, we are like a clinging isn't it? We are just like the bell. You got to balance your life with a gifting and fruit. And God will make sure he, you bear that fruit. He will make sure. He will bring people that tab you, that tab you at the back to teach you how to love them so that you can bear fruit, that you don't just prophesy to them. I remember one time I prophesied to somebody. In, in 6 8. Oh man, what that person went and said about that same prophecy. And for sure, God did it for that person. But whatever they said, I felt like withdrawing. <laughs> because they talked so badly. But God was teaching me, can I love them? So even if you have all manner of gifting, even if you say to this mountain, move from here to the end, you have no love. You are like a sounding gong. So you be heard by the bell when you're in the presence, but you bear fruit. Can you have peace when things are not working? It's a fruit of the spirit. Can you have joy when half of the members have left? Can you have joy? It's a fruit. Can you be gentle? It's a fruit of the spirit. And God will make sure that I come to maturity in every of those so that my blue effort can have both bell and fruit. Bell and fruit. Do like that. Bell and fruit. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Bell and fruit. Bell and, yes. Yes. And that fruit does not come. It's so easy to make noise. But that fruit to come out of you, hey, my friend, you go through all kinds of things. All. God will use anything including your mother, your husband, for the man, your wife. God will do anything to make sure that character is formed in me. Character is formed in me. And every time I feel that test, I go back. Why? God is a loving father. Amen? God is a loving father. He's a loving father. So let's forget about the devil and his works. Let's look at God working in me, both to will and to do. Of his good pleasure. All what we pass through most times, even if the Bible says that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. For we know that tribulations bring, they, 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 they bring patience and patience brings character. Character. 
whatever it is, whatever, whatever, God is working. Some are so bad, but it's still God who is working in me to bring out character. May the Lord help us. Let's do again. Bell and, bell and, bell and. Okay, let's, let's finish. What about the breastplate? You shall make the breastplate of judgment artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. You shall make of it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, you shall make it. It shall be doubled into a square. A span shall be its length, and a span shall be its width. And this is the way it looked like. Okay? So this is the breastplate, now with the stones. It says, the breastplate was as beautifully and skillfully made as the ephod, using the same material of heavy woven Cloth. It was positioned over the heart, showing that judgment, discernment, and decision came from the heart. One, it was equal, meaning that the priest had to make fair judgment without partiality. That's why it was a square. So you learn in your life to make fair judgments. Okay? It was also held in place by golden chains attached to the onyx shoulder clasp, and also by blue lace ribbons. And that speaks of oneness and of God's affection, that tying, oneness. Your heart is connected to the burden, you remember? What did it have? I already said it had stones. Let me show you the stones. Let's first go to it. So first of all, that's the breastplate. You will see it just behind, and the stones that are laid there, uh, 333, three, three. okay, and... We already said it was beautiful. It was like the ephod. It was positioned of the heart, showing judgment, discernment, and decision-making. It was a square, meaning that the priest had to make judgment without partiality. It was also held in place by golden chains attached to the onyx shoulder clasps and also by the blue lace ribbons, speaking of oneness and God's affection. Now it had this components that I talked about, the stones, and you shall put settings of stone in it, four rows of stones. The first row shall be, shall be sardius, a topaz, and an emerald. And you need to go and study. Why were these stones? And they are the same stones we find in the book of Revelation. Okay? The second row shall be a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row is a jacinth, a gate, and an ameth- a- amethyst. And the fourth row are those stones. They shall be set in gold settings. Now, and, and the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its name, they shall be according to the 12 tribes. And that's how one stone looked like, the onyx stones. The stones set on the breastplate had the names, as we said, written on them, similar to the ones on the shoulder. You remember the ones for the ephod were six and six. Okay? I mean, six names, six names. The fact that they were placed over the heart shows that God required the priest to have love for the people. You remember what we say? It was burden for the ephod. It is carrying the burden for the breastplate is at the heart, showing you must have love for the people. Ministry. Ministry must be done out of love. Ministry must be done out of love for God's people. First Timothy 1, 5 to 11. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Love, the purpose of ministry. Please write that. The purpose of ministry. Whatever you do, however you serve, is really should be love. Really should be love. I pray God will give me more love. The more love I will have, the more I will minister in joy. The more I'll minister with peace. It's not competition. We are not trying to compete. We're not trying to build the best ministry on the earth. We are not even trying to compare ourselves. May the Lord give us love. That the reason why we minister is love. Amen? Amen.
Otherwise, if you compete, you will close your ministry. Or you'll be looking at Facebook. What are they doing? Then we do. What are they doing? Well, very soon you'll be so tired you will stop. It should be love motivating you. Even for that one. Jesus said, he leaves the 99. He goes for how many? He goes for how many? So what is moving? What is motivating him? Exactly. So love is, is the, that was the stone's made. Now we go back to the chains again. You shall make the chains of breastplate at the end, like braided cords of pure gold, and you shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate and put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. Then you shall put the two braided chains of gold in the two rings, which are the ends of the breastplate, and the other two ends of the two braided chains you shall fasten to the two settings and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in the front. Let me not read that because of time. So we said the chains connected the breastplate and the ephod. They are the same chains. They are symbolic of joining between the heart and responsibility. So it's carrying the burden, but the burden is driven by love. Not trying to make a name for yourself. God will still give you a name. Not trying to make the best ministry. Not trying to build the best church. Not trying to be the best worship leader. Not trying to be anything but responsibility. Just being moved. With the love, being moved by love. Symbolic of joining between the heart and responsibility. What else did the breastplate have? The breastplate had Urim and Thummim. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim. And they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. The Urim and the Thummim were placed in the breastplate to be worn over the priest's heart. They were object used for making decisions. And please go. Everything we mentioned, go and, go and do a word search in the Bible. Study it. You will see, and the priest consulted the Urim. The Bible will say God did not talk to Saul either by Urim or by prophets or by dreams. Okay? So they, were, they helped them, the priest to make decisions to design things of the spirit. The power of perception and discernment was built in the structure of the breastplate. That Urim, the Hebrew word is Ur, meaning light, meaning that the priest should have illumination of the word of God. They should seek direction from the illumination of the word. So whatever ministry or workplace, whatever, because even if it's workplace, it's still ministry. Please, as I may talk more from a point of ministry, Christian ministry, but whatever you are doing is ministry. So it should be illuminated by the word of God. What about the thumin? The thumin is to me, meaning perfection. So it's light and perfection. It's an emblem of complete truth, simplicity, innocence, integrity, perfection, and uprightness. That's what it means. Complete truth, simplicity, innocence, integrity, perfection, and, up, and, and uprightness. So God placed Urim and Thummim. There are perfections and light. The Urim is a light. The Thummim is a perfection. Perfections and light. Perfection and light. They were here. So when somebody would consult with a priest, then that would light. So you position yourself in a way you have a very high discernment, but at the same time walk in truth, simplicity, innocence, integrity, perfection, and uprightness. So that's the summary of the breastplate. Let me not go through it. What about the linen tunic? The linen tunic or robe, you remember it? Let me show you. Let's read together. You shall skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen thread. You shall make the turban of fine linen, and you shall make the sash of woven. Let's first leave the turban and the, and, the, and the sash. Let's look at the tunic. This tunic, that's the way the tunic was, the linen tunic or the linen robe. You remember inside was the linen and then the blue one on top, isn't it? So this is the linen one, and it's the one Jesus wore. It was the seamless linen. You remember when they divided his garment? And they said that they couldn't divide the, the white garment, the linen garment, because it had no seam. And so they had to cast lot on it. It was the same one of a priest made of linen. 
We say the priest garments were made of linen because they should not sweat so that there is no perspiration, meaning there are no human effort. Okay, so the linen. The linen represents holiness. It represents righteousness. It's a way of positioning yourself. No work of the flesh. Please make sure you are walking in holiness. You are walking in righteousness. It's a way to position you yourself. It's a garment to wear so that you can be ready to minister. Otherwise, you cannot be ready to minister unless you're walking in holiness and in righteousness. What about the sash? You remember the two types of sash we talked about? Eh? There was the one on the ephod that was exactly the same color of the ephod that was on top. And then there is the one I told you that is inside. He said, you shall skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen thread. You shall make the turban of fine linen and you shall make the sash of woven work. Sash or a belt, as I said, represents walking in the truth. It's a truth that ties you together. It's a truth. And the truth will set you free. What about the linen trousers? You remember the linen trousers? We already said they were there. And you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They were for covering their nakedness. They were also a sign of love because love covers a multitude of sin. So when you walk in love, when you walk in forgiveness, also that becomes a covering for you yourself before the Lord. Let's look at the turban and the crown. The turban and the crown, the Bible says, you shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of the signet, holiness to the Lord, and you shall put on a blue cord that it may be on the turban. It shall be on the front of the turban, and so it shall be on Aaron's forehead. That Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things. So that's the turban and the crown. Okay, it looks a bit purple, but actually it should be blue. So you have the turban made of linen. You have the crown that is tied, fixed on the turban by the blue, by the blue cord. Okay, that's what it is. That Hebrew word for the turban is derived from a verb which means to roll or to wind around. That's the white turban. This meant that the high priest turban was wound around his neck like a tiara. The headdress of the high priest represented his subordination to God, his subjection to God, his obedience. You know, obedience has a lot to do with mind, making up your mind to do. His obedience to God, command, and submission to his will. The fine linen, which also made the garment, also tells of the person's personal righteousness, which must be found in one who stands in the presence of God. The crown that was on the turban was made of pure gold. It represented the need for pure. I told you gold represents a place of purity, complete purity and excellence. It represented the need for pure mentalities and thinking systems in the priest as he carried out his responsibility for the people before God. Pure mentalities. Cleaning your mind, having the mind of Christ, having the mind of Christ. And that is the crown. So let's finally look at the order of dressing. The order of dressing, how did they put on it? Summarized in Leviticus 8, verse 6 to 9. And we shall read together. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And he put the tunic on him. He put the tunic. Which tunic is being referred to? The white linen tunic, because the what is inside. Of course, the priest, because he's putting on him, do you think the priest came there naked? No, no. Do you think the priest came there naked? What was the priest wearing when he came so that he could put on? The linen? So he put on him the tunic on him. You remember the tunic, the white one? Guarded him with the first sash. You remember the sash, eh? Clothed him with the... Which robe is this one? Which robe is this one? The blue robe. And put the ephod on him. Which one was the ephod? The color, the multicolored government. And he guarded him with the intricately woven band of the, or the other sash, isn't it? And with it tied the ephod on him. Then he put the breastplate on him and the urim and the in the let's read together. And he Put the turban on his head, also on the turban, on his throne. He put the golden plate 
the holy crown as the Lord had commanded. So all what we are missing is how, I mean, of course the breastplate had what? Chains that tied it to the, to the, to the stones on the, on the shoulders. Ah, yeah. So there it is. That's an, another one. Does this look much better? Absolutely. Yeah, you now see the crown. You see the turban, the crown. You see the chains. Actually, you can see the chains now. You can see the breastplate. You can see the ephod. You see the blue one. You see all that. All right, so we are done.